Hi, I'm Arlene McIntyre, Creative Director at Ventura Design, and you are listening to Shut the Front Door, a lighthearted podcast that will bring you through the front door and into the homes of influential and interesting people. Home for me is one of the most important things in my life. My career has fortunately given me the opportunity to work closely with people and to help them create a home they will cherish forever. We've changed our direction a little bit with today's episode of Shut the Front Door. With the current times and challenges we are now facing, we wanted to stop and look towards something we all need a little more of these days, which is hope. We are overjoyed to be joined today by the world-renowned spiritual teacher, Lorna Byrne. I have followed Lorna for over 20 years, and she gives hope and compassion to so many all over the world, myself included. I'm sure that many homes across Ireland and beyond have at least one of Lorna's best-selling books, especially the international and Sunday Times number one best-selling Angels in My Hair. Lorna has been published in more than 50 countries and in 30 languages around the world. A regular on Irish TV shows such as The Late Late Show and Ireland AM, her story is extraordinary and I hope you find some words of comfort from our chat today. Named in 2019 as one of the 100 most spiritually influential living people in the world, it is my great pleasure to introduce Lorna Byrne. Lorna, thank you very much for joining uh, us today. Well, I'm delighted um, to be talking with you, Arlene, and um, hopefully giving plenty of hope and and faith and comfort to to the audience as well. So I'm really looking forward to whatever questions you would like to ask. I just think that it's particularly interesting to um, speak with you at the moment, particularly uh, with all that's going on in the world, Lorna. Um, it just seems like the world is upside down. I mean, you know, between uh, the fires in Australia and terrorism and global warming and climate change and flooding and and now uh, the coronavirus. Yeah, it does seem like as if the world has been in, you know, chaos. Um, But I I believe in the angels tell me... um, that we will get through this. And I, I know we're meant to come out the other side, you know, better human beings, full of more love and compassion. And, you know, this this is a time, I suppose, we, we need to reflect. You know, we need to listen to the spiritual side of ourselves, to our soul. We need to be more aware of our guardian angel. And one thing the angels always taught me from a child and and my grandmother used to say to me, and that was give with a pure heart and expect nothing in return. And you see that happening today more so than ever before. Um, Mm -hmm. And I just pray and ask that that will, will continue. I think people are really trying. We're all brothers and sisters and we all need each other. And the light of hope is burning brightly all of the people that I interviewed for this podcast, I asked them, are they spiritual people? And often um, some people will pause for a moment because they're not even sure what that means or they've perhaps never been asked that question before or they've never really thought about it before. So how would you define spiritualism? Um, For me, um, it's a lovely question, and and I think when you do ask people, they kind of he- hesitate because they're really unaware of spirituality. But for me, what God and the angels have taught taught myself is that spirituality has to do with knowing that you have a soul, that spark of light of God, that you're not just a human being, you're a spiritual being as well. And I have been shown that both have to intertwine together. Mm-hmm. And I think it's just becoming conscious of that. And even when you ask someone that question, you know, that's why they hesitate. And lots of people all over the world now are even saying to their newborn child, how is your soul today? We need to become more and more conscious that we have a spiritual side. And the other wonderful thing is that because we have this spark of light of God that's so enormous and yet so tiny, um, we have a guardian angel that never leaves us, even for one second. So we're never alone. I always remember the child asking the question at a, a book signing. And seemingly, I never realized it, but 
I was in America and this shop I was doing the book signing in was mainly Catholic seemingly. Um, not that I would notice because I, I wouldn't because the angels are everywhere and everyone has a guardian angel. And this little child came up with her mom and, you know, her question was, did my daddy have a guardian angel with him when he died? And I said, yes, of course. And she said, we were, my mom was just so worried because we're Jewish. And I said to her, every single person has a guardian angel. It doesn't matter what religion you are, or even if you don't believe in God or angels, or you don't believe you have a soul, you have a guardian angel. And that was so comforting because she turned to her mom and she was only about seven. And she said to her mom, now I told you dad didn't die alone. His guardian angel was right there with him. Oh. You know, and, and it is just becoming aware that mm -hmm. you are a spiritual being as well. And, and that brings out lots of love. You change. You become more compassionate and more caring. You even, you know, you start to open and you start to see the beauty of our planet. You see the beauty and love in everyone. Um, and, and you care more, you change completely and you start to love yourself and you become happier. You know, mm -hmm. I always say what is impossible becomes possible. You know, um, you don't look on, you know, that just the material things are the important things in life. And that's what people are realizing now. It's not about the material things. It's about our loved ones. Mm -hmm. It's about our family, our friends. It's about our neighbors, you know. And, 100%. Yeah, and, and that's growing spiritually. You know, sometimes I just say miracles happen in disguise. We don't notice them at the time. But I pray and ask for lots of miracles to happen for people. You know, what is the best for them? Because sometimes we don't know what's the best for ourselves. And... Just becoming aware spiritually is kind of opening up our world, you know, um, and I believe people can can do that. Like we exactly. can all become, you know, part of, in one sense, the new generation. We're changing. You know, we, we, can, we can change this world. Look at what our governments have done all over the world in a weak kind of thing. They changed everything to protect mm -hmm. us all. You know, so we can change everything again for the better when we get through this and to and to protect our planet as well and and nature. And the thing is, I know we always get viruses every year. You know, just this virus is a little a little bit different. Yes, it seems so aggressive and it's an interesting one because it, it doesn't matter uh, what you earn or who you are. It, it, it's just impacted everybody, everywhere. I mean, no it's, one is safe, really. Yeah, you know, it's it, it doesn't have boundaries. And I guess in one way, that's teaching us something as well, spiritually. And it's one thing the angels and God always taught me was to have no boundaries. You know, you shouldn't put a boundary up in front of you or say you have to be a particular person to knock on this door. Um, we're all spiritual beings and human beings and I'm looking forward to the day I don't believe I will be here you know when we make this earth like a little glimpse of heaven and that's one of the futures I have always written about and that has to happen mm -hmm. you know that that is where I see children cross the river and they don't need a bridge where I see well wow. you know they have opened up so spiritually that even a blade of grass, they have so much to learn from it. And these are things at the moment we can't see. Um, I always tell people, you know, I see so much, not just the angels. And, and if I can, so can you. You can see your guardian angel. Just, it's kind of maybe in one sense, have faith, have belief. Pester your guardian angel. Give out to God. I'm forever giving out to God. I can tell you I've been doing that a lot these days, um, mm -hmm. you know, but just open yourself spiritually and, and just say, I believe I have faith and it doesn't, you know, it's it's the one God and, and 
that's the sad thing. We we cause an awful lot of wars over God, you know, which is ridiculous when it's the one mm. God and he loves us all. He has no boundaries. God has no, doesn't discriminate against any of us in an, in any way. He loves us all. And I know people find that hard. Well, then why this virus? You know, he gave us this beautiful planet as a gift. And sometimes when you're given something freely, you mistreat it. And these viruses do break out, you know, and, and we just have to learn how to fight them. But we have to learn how to be better carers of the earth. Lorna, just uh, to ask you a very, again, another very simple question. A lot of people that might be listening to this would never dream of saying a prayer or wouldn't even know how to begin to say a prayer or might not have uh, or believe in any particular religion. So how would you advise people like that to connect with their angels? Well, the first thing I, I would say is just to say hello to the guardian angel and just say, God, please help me, whatever that power, whatever words they want to use, just ask and ask from it from your heart and your soul. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes a prayer is just one word. It can be just help. It can be just save. It can be just, I need you. Mm. It can be, I'm lost. You know, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter. But if you know any prayers, I would say, say them. Mm -hmm. You know, but talk, talk to God as well. Talk to your guardian angel, you know. And, and learning how to slow down is going to be a big adjustment for everybody in the world, you know. Yeah, I think that is lovely that we, we are learning that and, and slowing down helps you to reflect. If, well, I know you can't buy paint at the moment, but they could prepare the house for, you know, a new fresh up. You know, we change the furniture around. You could, there's loads of things you, you could do. You could repair something. You could make something. You know, um, you Definitely. could... Definitely. That, that's for it. sure, Lorna. I, I mean, that, that would be what I do for a living. And I'm in people's homes all the time. And um, I've been asked a lot uh, through social media, you know, for tips on how to rearrange furniture in the home or... I, or you might get messages like, I have all this time on my hands this week. What should I do with such and such? Or what do you think about this? And it's lovely to think that people just are now reflecting on their home, you know, where they spend a lot of their time at the moment. Yeah, because and, we often say home is where the heart is. For and sure. That is something incredible that, that, that you're doing, helping people to reflect back and look at their home and not just think of it as as a, a piece of material thing that, you know, they take for granted and mm. fresh, freshening it up. And sure, that that's an incredible, and there is so many incredible things people are helping other people to do. That's that's true. And, uh, you know, it, it, and I often find throughout the years of being in this business that we've created some really beautiful homes and beautiful looking homes with lovely and beautiful things within the homes but they may lack that kind of soul you know or there there won't have there isn't that feeling that it's going to be a home if you know what I mean it looks yeah. beautiful but it doesn't feel homely feel, feel like home and, and the important part is that it feels like home it doesn't need like need to be like a, a page on a magazine um, exactly. I, have, I have to say I love old things so um, I don't know if you remember my house here, but I don't know what it was like you do. then. Um, you just bought it at the time. So it was um, still in repair, I think, then. It was. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I do love old things. So, of course, I was saving all the old furniture that was here. And, you know, just I have all the walls painted white because the windows are so small because white reflects light. Um, but I do love flowers and, and I love old things. I love old houses, anything old. 
and um, you give Anything it to me old. and I will repair it or or I'll have a friend that can repair, you know, um and and then when you polish them up they look so beautiful and you say to yourself, Why would someone throw that into a bin? You know, I know. Why disregard something so so beautiful. So I can imagine what you do to homes. You must you must make them shine. You help people to make them shine. Yeah, and I think I, I love when I feel someone's genuinely really happy in their home. And, um, you know, you can't buy happiness, obviously, and you can't you can't install happiness into somebody's home, but you can layer in things that might make them uh, feel happy, like, you know, a colorful painting in a room that might otherwise have been very monochrome might just, you know, raise the energy in that room and make them, you know, feel happy every time they look at a certain piece. Well, it makes them, what would you say, you know, feel happy to get back home again. Yeah. You know, a place of peace, a pl- pl- place of love, a place where they feel embraced, you know, um, and that that's very important. And as you said, it can even be a painting on the wall, you know, or it can be flowers on the table or... Something inspirational that inspires them. Yeah. Or, or, or a chair that they love to sit in and they say, I love being home, you know, or, or the fire, you know, um, glowing in the heart. It can be yeah. or photographs that they have in different places that they can glance at, you know, but you have to have those things, what would you say, with light on them, bright. You have yes. to have home bright. And by the sounds of it, Arlene, you're brilliant at doing that. Just about you and your childhood memories of home. What was your what memories do you have of your um, one? Well, my first memory would be, you know, of our home in Old Kamenam. And again, I can understand why I fell in love with anything that's old. Um, it was a little cottage with a shop and they were all attached on the one street. Um, but they were all very old and, in a sense, very dark because few windows, so little light coming in. But it was always the light from the fire. And I just loved Old, Com- old Kamenum because, you know, mom had this teeny tiny little kitchen. You couldn't even move around in. But the little front room was where we ate and everything like that. And then the two bedrooms were upstairs. And then, of course, Dad's workshop and that smell of rust and oil. You know, I think there I fell in love with all things from the very beginning. Um, and I think I left there when I was maybe five or six. I'm never sure what age. Mm-hmm. Um, or I could have been a little bit older. And then our second home, when that, when that house... Um, sadly collapsed the roof fell in and my mom's precious things got destroyed you know her presents that you would have gotten there wouldn't have been many but that was a very special home to me because that is where how would you say from from being an infant the angels introduced themselves to me you know, and to me, the angels were just part of the family. And yes. the other memory, which is so strong, and I have written about it in Angels in My Hair, was, you know, playing with my little brother in front of the fire. He was actually my older brother. He was always older than me. And we playing with little wooden blocks my dad made. And he saying to me, you know, I can sit with my back to the fire because it won't burn me. And you have to remember, I was only two or two and a half at most at that time. And we'd play playing with these blocks and laughing and just having fun. And then, you know, our hands touched. And it was like his hand went into mine or mine went into his and they just sparkled, sparks flew everywhere. And I felt such love. 
And it was at that time that the angels said to me that they were angels and I was to keep it a secret. But they told me my little brother was a soul. He had died before I was born. Oh. I always call him my little brother. You know, wow. but he he was older. Like at that time, playing mm. at the fire with me, he was about maybe six or five. I forget what age I might have put, but he was way older than me. And being such a young child, you don't question things, you know, but they were always reminding me I must keep it a secret, say nothing to anyone. But sometimes I would see my little brother as an infant in my mom's arms, you know. Yeah. And even then I never, it's kind of, it's weird in one way, I never questioned it. It was just normal and natural. And I suppose that's that's the difference to me. All this is normal and natural. It's just like for yourself, everyone you see in the world, you see them as you see them. But I see them and I see their guardian angel as well. But that was my first home and so much happened there. And, and then, of course, it fell in, the roof fell in. And my aunt, who was a young woman, and her parents had died. And she offered that we could move into her home with her. And so we were homeless for a little while, but not too long. And I always thank God for for her heart opening and offering my mom and dad we could go and live with her. So that was, and that again was an old house, you know, with the big garden. Um, and that was in Ballymon. And then eventually we actually moved into a new house and that was in Rohini. And I suppose over over time, you know, when when my dad would have holidays from work, you know, the way way back then you'd get two weeks holiday. I think it's the same today in the summertime. But he would always bring us to his his mom's house. But she didn't actually have a house. She was a caretaker of a hostel and she moved around from one hostel to another around the country. Um, so every time you went to a hostel, no matter where it was, it was always old. But one hostel that um, she was in for years was Mount Shannon, Mount Shannon House. And it was a hostel at the time. And it was owned by Lady Talbot in England. And seemingly she would come over to visit um, every now and then. And Granny used to keep um, two rooms upstairs. And it was a mansion now, not a tiny house, a mansion. And um, I remember one day peeping in, my grandmother allowed me to peep in the door, not to go in, just peeping the door and seeing all of this magnificent furniture, which we would call old style today. Um, mm -hmm. And it looks so, so beautiful, but it had this enormous stairs, um, you know, that I used to love going up and down. Everything was old about this mansion, just, just beautiful, but it was a beautiful hostel as well. My grandmother looked after the hostelers very well as well, and sometimes they would have sing songs. Okay. So I fell in love with old houses, anything old. <laughs> mm. And then you, when you were in Maynooth, and I remember that that was also a very a beautiful home That's... as well. That was, um, at the beginning, that was a little cottage. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually, and again, it, it was old. And, you know, I always remember having to scrape off um, the lino off the floors because underneath what they used to do long ago to keep the place warm would have been, you know, straw and clay. So underneath the lino was all the straw and clay, like an insulation. Um, so I always remember scraping all of that off and trying to save, um, which I did, the old furniture that was still in the house. And the lady that lived there before ourselves was um, a Mrs. Costello. 
um, in Maynooth and I, I loved Maynooth. Mm. Um, just so much happened there. That's where I reared my my children. Um, my first three, my fourth child, more or less down here in in mm-hmm. Kilkenny. Um, but yeah, I love Maynooth. I go back to visit all of the time, and of course, I love the elite. When I go mm-hmm. back, I go down there for a cup of tea or coffee or something. <laughs> I'm sure you still have friends there that you love to meet and catch up with, and. Yeah, I I I love to um, meet a couple of friends when when I'm there, and of course my family, and we still have my son still has the the old house in in Maynooth, um, Christopher, so he he lives there. So it's great that every time when I'm traveling abroad, um, I would go up to up to Maynooth and stay with my son Christopher, and then the next day head to the airport. That's so perfect. And Lorna, when you enter people's homes, what's the first thing you notice when you go into someone's home? Is it um, the energy of the of the home? Um, or? No, it, I, I would say it's it's the love I would feel. Mm-hmm. The love I, I would feel and see. You know, even if, if that home has sadness that there's something wrong, but I would see the love that's there as well. And I always know, you know, love love conquers so much. Um, I have never been in a home that didn't feel homely. You know, and I think I'm blessed for that. And sometimes somebody would say to me, well, you're going to visit such and such. It has bad energy. Or, you know, it's not a good place. They're not nice people. And I always say, but they are nice people. And I love them. Mm. Regardless, you know, and it's like when I would go, then things would change, change for the better. There would be more love and more, more kindness. And And Lorna, when you're traveling and you're in the airport or when you're sitting in an airplane, do you ever have a look around and see people's angels on that airplane? Yes. Um, that's something I don't talk about much as, as such, but yes, of course. And sometimes when I would glance in where the pilots are, I would see their angels as well, the guardian angels with them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just something lovely to see and reassuring. And mm-hmm. um, sometimes when, even when I'm at the airport, you know, the crowd is the airports and I would see the guardian angel with, with everyone. And sometimes someone would walk up to me, a complete stranger, and just say, thank you. So none of us ever pray alone. Mm. Lorna, may I ask you a question about Christmas? Uh, is You wrote about this in one of your books about Christmas and uh, the, the Christmas angel, I think you referred to it as. Um, and how you see it flying all over all of the houses at Christmas time. Can you share something more with us? Yeah, I I see that every single Christmas, you know, um, as it's coming towards Christmas, just seeing those angels, um, how can I describe it sometimes? It's like, you know, the gate of heaven, which is, I always try to, I try to explain what this enormous gate looks like looks like stone and it's full of light all kinds of sparks and I see these two enormous angels and they kind of push it just this little bit and you just slowly start to see this crack of light just brilliant light and then those angels just come streaming out and each of them are carrying so gently and so lovingly you can see it in the palm of their hands their their hands are together and you see this ball of light and they drop this ball of light over every single home in the world whether it's a house or a caravan or a cardboard box um or a hotel no home in the world is missed Mm. and watching them dropping that ball of light it's like when it touches a home it it kind of explodes 
you know, and you see sparks everywhere and it seems to go into every nook and cranny of that home and into every person that is in that home. And it just fills them with, you know, that spirit of Christmas. Mm -hmm. It softens their heart. And again, it it goes back to to love. And, And the wonderful thing is that sometimes when somebody is missing from that home, the angels will come back again when that person is there and drop another ball of light. Um, it's just incredible to see and to see how it does touch people. Uh, at the moment, with, with health care is under so much like enormous pressure, um, trying to save lives and, you know, and look after themselves at the same time. Time. Um, it, it, how, how is that? Can you see into that situation or what's coming to you well, on that? Well, what, what I have been told is that, you know, God and the angels are giving all of these doctors and nurses, um, cleaning staff, every, you know, chemist every, everywhere, all of those those people, the strength and the courage. But we have to protect them as well. So we have to do what our government is telling us, is stay at home as much as possible. But we must pray for them. We, we must pray and ask that as few of them, as few of them get this virus, and any that do get the virus, that they will get through it. I know already some nurses and doctors have died and, and some of them have been quite young. And that's to think of someone giving their life for you. And that's what they're doing. They're giving their lives to save lives. Mm, that's true. love. That's love beyond what most of us ever do to give a life to save another that's one of the most incredible things to do Um, and that is what everybody that is on the front line the carers everyone even those in the factories and in our shops um, are doing you know they're putting us first because in one way they don't realize that they love us all We actually love each other. That is one thing the angels and God keeps telling me. We love each other. It's just that we have been in denial of it. And so I would ask everyone to pray for all of those that are out in the front line. And even those that don't know that are. To pray and ask for protection for them to keep them safe. But we have to and play our part as well. We have to do what we're told. And I know lots of us want to fight against that, Mm -hmm. you know, want to say, well, why should we, you know, but there's so many vulnerable people out there and they're not just elderly people. They are children too. Yeah. um, That have asthma and different diseases, which I have to say the light of hope is burning so brightly. And we all have to keep on seeing that light of hope. And I know we're going to get through this. And do you I, think I know, we're going to get through this soon? Or do you see this prolonging for some time to come? I, I think the prolonging part is depends on us. Depends on us as such. And once we do what we know we're meant to do to protect each other until we're sure that it is completely gone. But we have to remember as well Every year we have viruses, you know, and most of them, you know, we we get through OK. Um, how long it's going to last, I don't know, but I keep on asking God, let it be as short as possible. May I ask you a question, Lorna? Um, what is God like? I love that question. Um I I know God is neither male nor female, but God always gives me a male appearance. Okay. Sometimes God has been a child. 
when with me. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I am always a child. And in God's library, God gave a male appearance. Um, just so radiant. And do angels specialize in certain things, Lorna? For example, um, are there cooking angels you can call on? Are there uh, driving angels you can call on? I, or if you're I, looking for a car space in a car park, can you ask an angel to help you find a car space? Lots, lots of people do that. Lots of people would, would ask for a parking space and they would tell me they get it every time. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one thing I never do myself. Um, because I'm severely dyslexic, so since I was a child, I would say to the angels, "I'm doing it myself. Leave me alone." Hmm. Um, so yes, you can you can turn around to to your guardian angel and you can say, "I need a helping hand with whatever you're doing, whether it's your artwork or your cooking or or you're stressed." An angel, your guardian angel will have a particular angel there to help you with whatever that problem is. Are you born with your guardian angel? Or... Yes. Um, yes. That's a lovely question. And I know I have written about that as well in the books. Um, you, you meet your guardian angel when you are in heaven before you're even conceived. And I know people find this hard to understand, but you and your guardian angel stand in front of God. You're in, you're in God's arms. And God tells your guardian angel um, to take care of you and to bring you back home when it's your time. Because your guardian angel is the gatekeeper of your soul. It can never leave you for one second. And it loves you unconditionally. You may not love yourself or, or you may think sometimes someone would say to me, they're not a very nice person or they have done something wrong, my guardian angel must be mad with me or mustn't be talking to me or my guardian angel must have left because I have done a terrible thing. Your guardian angel loves you unconditionally, no matter what. You know, that is so important. That has given many people, men, women and children around the world, such comfort. Your guardian angel believes in you and knows even if you've done something wrong or or you've been mean or selfish or anything like that, it knows you can change. It loves you. It it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I think that is incredible about the guardian angels. It's always there with you. And do you think, Lorna, in your opinion, that they should hopefully, well, in the future, that they might, the future might have where, where children learn how to be spiritual rather than learning about a religion, per se. Well, I think religion and spirituality, in a sense, are, they're combined, they're intertwined, and so do they, science. Do they have to be? Um, I don't think so. In, in one sense, spirituality came first. We, we were aware. And, and when God made himself known through different generations back thousands of years ago. I suppose the humankind in one way saw, you know, this as a powerful thing to have power over others. And even today that has has happened today. That's why I would say, you know, we use God as a weapon instead of a weapon of mass destruction, instead of a weapon of love. And again, it has to do with man wanting power over another. We have to realize we don't, we don't need to use God in that way. Mm-hmm. And that is the, the, sad, the sad part. Yeah. Um, but God loves, loves us all and, and we're not meant to be doing that. And Lorna, do you mind if I ask you, um, just how you relax. I mean, uh, you're busy, obviously, um, helping people and and connecting with people every day, all day long. Um, but at the end of a very long day, you must feel very exhausted. I'm sure that can be very draining on you. Um, sometimes I give out to God and, I, and the angels and I say, I need a break. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes they say no. 
not just yet, but um, then later on I, I would get get a break. But one thing, I, I love what I'm doing. I actually enjoy everything because, again, the angels have taught me to love me. They've taught me to enjoy life, to enjoy everything. If, if I was caught out in the rain or the cold, I would actually be enjoying it and loving it as well, where lots of us teach ourselves to be miserable or disappointed. Um, it's the essence of life. It's, it's to enjoy life. It's, it's to allow your soul to come forward. It's just to grow more, more spiritually in in that in that way um i could never get bored or, or tired of what i do and are and you because, a good sleeper lorna do you like to sleep like are um, you i like to sleep i have to smile at this one god doesn't let me sleep very much sometimes really? i will be awake praying mm-hmm. and then when i do fall asleep my soul does be in prayer and my body is very aware of it being in prayer. Um, I think it is because I'm so conscious of, of my soul. Um, yeah. But the world needs lots of prayers today and we all need lots of help. So I'm here for that reason, to help wherever I can. Mm. It's your and vocation, so- really. Yeah, and, and so many miracles have happened in, in my life. So many things that I was shown as a child that would come about and I would have said to the angels and still do, no way, that can't happen. You know, I'm completely dyslexic, you know, but yet you can see what God has me doing anyway. And have you ever been absolutely stunned and amazed yourself at how things can happen that you've asked for that you that you might have had you ever have any doubt that it's something that you ask for might happen or do you always believe that it I, can or will yeah i i only act, i never ask for anything for myself as such mm-hmm. i only ask for others um, that's what i meant for, for say for yeah, others for for others yeah i'd be so happy i'd be so glad that whatever it was that I was asking for others. And at the moment, I ask, I am asking for everybody in the whole world to get through this and to see the light of hope and for them to know that this will pass and for us to come out better people, full of love and kindness and, you know, to heal, to heal our planet. In, in that way and I believe all of that will happen and just to grow more and more spiritual I often ask God you know why did you fall in love with us look at what we're doing to each other look at all the wars and the starvation look at you know we only think of the material things but I do believe we are changing mm-hmm. I I can see the goodness. You know, we can keep on looking at all the negative things and all the bad things that we're that our eyes are closed to all of the wonderful and good things in the world, all the incredible things, all the wonderful people. Um, and we have to open our eyes to see that. And I believe that's even happening now during this horrific time this time that's full of fear I believe we are seeing a huge amount of good that we never realized was there before that's so, so true Lorna yeah. and may I ask you um, where do you see yourself in five ten years time um, I, that's another lovely question I actually don't um, I just I don't look on the world in that way or myself where do I see myself next I don't plan things Um, I just go down the road God puts in front of me and he has another road in front of me Um, and I'm going down that as well at the moment Um, but I can't tell you that over this podcast well you've piqued my curiosity now Lorna and is there one um, object in your home 
that is really precious to you? For me, it is everything within my home. Everything, I look on it as a blessing that I have these things um, and that I can share them with others. To me, I don't own, own anything. The world owns everything I own, if you understand that. Yes, I do. Whatever comes about on that, to me, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the world. I see a lot of um, houses, Lorna, and when I'm walking through them, I'll often see, you know, a candle burning or I'll see a little statue of an angel or I'll see a crystal or a metal or some form of an object that helps me understand them a little bit more. So, you know, you'll often see something in the home that kind of gives you a steer on, on maybe who they are and what they believe in. or It, it doesn't it have to mean anything other than do you believe in hope? Do you believe in kindness? Um, it doesn't actually mean it's, it goes back to re- a religion, per se. Yes, um, I, I would say sometimes as well, you know, lots of people would say they're open-minded. It's just another way to to say that they are spiritual, yeah. you know, and I think that word is being used a lot nowadays. People are saying they're open-minded. Mm-hmm. But one thing I do love, and that is, you know, in schools around the world, a lot of, what do they call it, teaching the children, you know, how to be compassionate and loving, well-being, I think sometimes they, they call it. Um, and that's very important yes. to that that's been brought into schools and been made a subject because of the way the world was going with material things and and gaining power and getting the best job going and thinking that was the only thing of life. A lot of children and young people lost empathy because they didn't see much of it in their parents either. You know, so they had to start to bring it into schools. And I, I do believe Ireland is doing the same, but slowly, not as, as much as other countries. But I think we still have to keep on showing children, you know, that we love them and they must be caring and understanding for others as well. We have to teach them empathy. Well, Lorna, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. And I found our, this podcast so interesting and inspiring. And I hope it um, gives our whole audience hope and inspiration during a really difficult time right now. Well, I would like to say thank you to you, Arlene, as well. You're absolutely a brilliant host. <laughs> so thank you. And I would just like to say to all of your listeners for them, you know, to know that they have a guardian angel right there with them and that they have a soul and that we are going to get through this because of the light of hope is burning very brightly and it shines in each and every one of us and let it shine more. We're going to get through this and we're going to come out the other end. We'll grieve for those that we've lost, but we will come out a much better people and we will make all the changes that we know our world needs um, and we will love each other more and more. So I'd like to say thank you to all of those who will listen to your podcast and I believe many, many, many will. And thank you, Arlene. You're welcome, Lorna. Thank you so much. Take care. Stay safe. God bless.